All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for... God, you obviously got us through the day thus far and brought us together, and we're uh, thankful for that, appreciative, Lord. As we open up uh, the study tonight, as we uh, talk about the superiority of Christ over angels, uh, help our our uh, minds and hearts to lock in on those things that you have for us, and, and Lord, the things that uh, we really don't need, Lord, uh, just help us not to overfill our memories. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we begun our study in the Epistle of Hebrews. We've been exploring how the uh, revelation or word spoken by God the Son is superior to that given in the Old Testament, spoken in various ways at various times through the prophets. And the author has done this uh, demonstrating the superiority of that revelation by showing us the superiority of the Son over the prophets. And so, kind of a summary, what we what we learned over the last couple of weeks, and it, it helps sometimes to get it all, you know, point one, point two, point three. So, uh, uh, what we've learned about the superiority of the Son over the prophets, and there are seven arguments that we've looked at. And for the most part, I'm drawing here, quoting from that, Weast uh, exposition that I talked about. And I will get that printed up. I did get a power cord for my printer, and, and hopefully I can get that working in the next day or two. So first, the Son is superior to the Old Testament prophets in that whereas they were the mouthpieces of God, he, Jesus, was God himself speaking on earth. Second, uh, the Son inherits all things, the prophets being part of that inheritance. The third, thing is the Son created all things and is the one who operates and manages the universe and all its creatures uh, all down the successive ages of time. Uh, the fourth is that the Son is the effulgence or the outrain of the glory of God, not merely in the sense that he is the outshining of that glory, but that he himself is a divine center of the outrain of God's glory or co-eternal and co-existent with the Father and of the same substance as the Father. Uh, and while the Son being eternal generation from the Father, yet also very God of very God, possessing in himself life and light. Fifth, the Son is the exact impression of the person and character of deity, thus uh, its exact expression. Sixth, the Son carries the weight of the universe, maintains its coherence, and carries on its development. And seventh, and finally, uh, he has, by uh, the shedding of his own blood on the cross, put away sin or purged uh, uh, our sin from us. <clears throat> so the Son is infinitely superior uh, to the prophets. Uh, uh, not one of those superiorities could be ascribed to any of the Old Testament prophets, uh, nor to those of any other religious system. Uh, and there are two things I want to remind us of before we jump into tonight's text. First, a reminder that this letter was written to Jewish believers. Those that had put their faith in Christ at some point, but they were Jewish in their heritage and their culture. They had come out of Judaism, Jewish believers who were being pressured to return to Judaism. So the author is showing the superiority of Christ over ideas held by the Jews that were underpinnings of Judaism. And that's going to be key, especially as we look at uh, angels tonight. First, as we've seen, he has shown that Jesus is superior to the prophets. Next, he will demonstrate the superiority of Jesus over the angels. And then uh, after that, he'll show the, the superiority of Christ over Moses uh, and also over the Aaronic priesthood. Now, not being Jews, we might take these things for granted. But to the Jews, all these things were a very big deal. The, the, uh, the way they venerated the prophets, the high esteem they had for angels. You know, angels in our culture even go through popularity seasons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in that Jewish Old Testament era, the, the, the place that angels held in their thought uh, was, was extremely important. Uh, Moses was very, very revered, and, and so forth. So, uh, uh, not being Jews, we might miss that, but we, uh, 
uh, as Gentile believers were getting a snapshot into the Jewish mindset with respect to Judaism. And that's key to understanding this book of Hebrews. But the second reminder is that what we're doing is we're seeing Jesus. This really, this, this epistle to the Hebrews is a treatise on Jesus and, and doctrine related to him. So what could be more worthy, <laughs> a, a more worthy subject to study? I mean, you know, I want to see Jesus more clearly. And, and, and so we're getting a lot of doctrine that relates to Christ. Uh, 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 we're seeing Christ uh, literally all the way through this, uh, this whole epistle. Now, as we left off last time, we saw that having purged our sin, he sat down uh, at the right hand of the majesty on high. His purging of our sin was a definite once-for-all act. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, that's important when we contrast Christ and his sacrifice to the Aaronic priesthood. Remember, he sat down. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty. We look back at the uh, Aaronic priesthood, and, and they ministered in the temple and the altar. There was no place for them to sit. Their work was never done. You know, it, it was sacrifice after sacrifice. Christ was a once for all, a very specific, definite, once for all sacrifice. And then in, in uh, light of that, that he sat down at the right hand of the Father, I don't know if we made a big deal out of it, but that's a reference to his glorification and his ascension, right? So uh, in both important doctrines again. Uh, and, and in his exalted state, he is still, right now today, Buried on, uh, on all things toward their des uh, destined consummation. The end of the age is coming, right? We're going to get a little glimpse of that at some point, just a, a little aside we'll throw out. But, but he's still holding it all together. He's still orchestrating. He's still managing uh, uh, everything towards their destined consummation. The end of the age is upon us. It will come. He will come back. He will establish his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. And, and, and then ultimately, Satan and, and, and uh, all of his wicked followers will be once or, or be finally judged, and, and there will be no more sin, no more evil, uh, all of that. So the consummation is coming. So Hebrews 1, verses 4 through 14. Hopefully we'll get all the way through it tonight. Uh, Hebrews 1, 4 introduces the next subject, uh, the superiority of Christ over the angels, which will continue through most of two chapters. We won't, we'll get phase one tonight. Phase two is a slightly different uh, peek at uh, some of the problems w relative to uh, the superiority of Christ over the angels. But uh, verse four, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And we might at this point ask the question, why angels? And, and so it may help our understanding to get a Jewish perspective on angels because uh, our perspective uh, is quite a bit different, uh, at least different to some degree, our, our, our Western uh, non-Jewish mindset. In fact, we suffer from a composite of biblical understanding as well as misconceptions gleaned from literature. We read about angels in literature. We've been reading about angels in literature, and so there have been some misconceptions that have crept into our thinking. Uh, let me illustrate what I mean. How many of you believe that there are fallen angels? Yeah, we read about them in the Bible, right? How many read uh, or, or, or believe there are demons? Yeah, we read about those in the Bible, right? How many believe that demons are fallen angels? Most of us. But where does it, the Bible actually tell us that? It doesn't. So, to the best of my understanding, anyway, it doesn't, and, and most scholars or commentators of books I've read would agree with that. But some have drawn the conclusion, uh, uh, that conclusion, and it's just a, uh, commonly accepted. Uh, it may be true, it may not be. I'm not suggesting that it's not true. I'm just saying the Bible doesn't specifically tell us that there are hints and, and different things that it might be true, but we're not specifically told. So that's a, a misconception or a, 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 a way that, you know, literature, but primarily English literature and uh, 
um, uh, is it Scottish literature? I, I forget now, but that, that, where that, that has crept into our, our, uh, our Western mindset. It, it, again, it may be true, it may not be true, but it's more presumption than stated fact from Scripture. So to us, Christ's uh, superiority uh, over the angels probably isn't a big deal, right? We, do, we don't struggle with that at all, do we? Yeah, of course, he, you know, he's greater than the angels uh, because we've been exposed to that thinking and, and that idea. So it's not such a big deal for us. We take it for granted. But the Jews, to the Jews, angels are a really big deal. And, and it, it's amazing when you start thinking about the Old Testament how frequently we read of angels being involved with the prophets or in their lives or with the nation in, in, in so many ways. We'll give a few examples but uh, it, it really is a big deal to them. And, and so to kind of, kind of illustrate this, we'll start in what may seem like an odd place uh, to begin a, a Jewish perspective by uh, taking a quick look at Acts chapter 7. <laughs> Remember Acts 7? That's Stephen's sermon before the Jewish Sanhedrin right before he was martyred. And, and actually his sermon there is a marvelous summary uh, of the Old Testament. In fact, uh, I think Chuck has mentioned it quite a few times uh, in, in the teaching over the last few years, how many believe that most of Paul's writings and, ser and, and sermons were impacted by Acts chapter 7 and Stephen's sermon before the Sanhedrin. So a really powerful thing. But as we get down to verse 53 of Acts 7, we learn something about how Moses was given the law that we don't often think about. And it, it, it tells us that it was by the disposition of angels, or in our New King James, it says the direction of angels. We simply say God gave Moses the law. If you've seen the Ten Commandments, you know, with uh, Charlton Heston, you know, and the finger of God wrote on the stone, and that's true. That happened. But, but we fail to, to really understand the part that angels played in that. We simply say that, that God gave Mo, uh, Moses the law, uh, and that angelic involvement is, uh, isn't foremost on our mind. But to the Jews, it is. Acts 7.53, we read, Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it, or by the uh, 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 disposition uh, of angels uh, and have not kept it. So, okay, that's, that's Acts, New Testament. Look back uh, at Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. And it says that he said, the Lord came from Sinai. That's where he received the Ten Commandments, the law, right? The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. He came with ten thousands of his saints. Who are those ten thousand saints? They're actually angels. Saints there is the term is actually holy ones. And most scholars agree that this is an Old Testament term for angels. So there are a lot of angels up, on, up there on Mount Sinai when Moses went up to receive the law. Remember that whole mountain was on fire and it was quaking. And, and in fact, uh, down below when the nation of Israel heard the voice of God, what did they tell Moses? <laughs> If we hear it again, we're going to die. <laughs> you go talk to God. It was a, a frightening thing. It was, we talk about, in, in prayer time, it came up, the, you know, how uh, ah, God, our awe of God, he's, he's awful in that right sense, you know, and, and certainly that was a, a place for it. Psalm 68, verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. Galatians 3.19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Wow. It's, it, the angels involved with the giving of the law to Israel. Uh, or to uh, uh, Moses. Uh, through Moses to Israel. We don't really focus in on that, right? But how important was the law to the Jew? It was everything. 
And so the involvement of angels, God involving angels in that process, angels are very, very special. Uh, so what we're trying to do, again, is to gain a Jewish perspective so that we can understand or gain sensitivity to the problem the author of the letter to the Hebrews is, is addressing in his arguments concerning uh, the superiority of Christ and, and why it's important, this, his superiority uh, of angels, and so we could understand his arguments about that. The idea being that if you were brought up in a Jewish home during the Old Testament era, you would have a very high view of angels. They're very special and uh, involved in many ways uh, with many important aspects of Jewish belief. Uh, appearances uh, of the angel of the Lord are all through the Old Testament. Uh, the angel that delivered Hagar, the angel that delivered Lot, while two other angels brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, the Passover night, the, the angel of the Lord went over and all the, the, the firstborn of, of man and beast that weren't, you know, uh, under the, the blood on the lintel uh, were, were killed. That was, you know, the angel of the Lord going over. Uh, Israel is steeped in... Uh, uh, interaction uh, with with angelic involvement in their their whole history, uh, the, the the most revered things, uh, the giving of the law, uh, interaction with the prophets. What what are the prophets? Do we not read about uh, an angel giving him a vision or doing something on his behalf? We know that angels take on various forms, sometimes appearing as men, sometimes uh, very wild forms, the cherubim, the seraphim. You know, Ezekiel. I'm still trying to figure out all those wheels within wheels. I want to see that one when I get to heaven because I just my pea brain just can't quite grab a hold of that one. Uh, six angels uh, or six wings uh, in the, the the seraphim that that Isaiah uh, you know uh, talks about. They're, they're they're sometimes they're on fire. They're just uh, really wild. And and most times when they see when man sees angels in that form, that you know the the not not human form. They quake and fall down. They want to worship. They're so majestic and everything. Of course, the angels stop them, worship God and Him alone. You know, but 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 the, the, literally, men almost fall down as if dead when they see these angels. So, uh, various forms. Sometimes they're actually entertained at awares, right? It tells us that in, later in Hebrews, we'll read that. We know that there are beings that are not to be trifled with. Just two angels destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in one evening. We read of uh, a time when everybody was asleep and one angel killed 185,000 crack Syrian soldiers in an evening. Just one, one angel. Think about those 12 legions of angels that Jesus could have called for when he was on the cross that he referred to, you know, and, and did, you know, but... but uh, uh, they're, they're not to be trifled with. We know that angels are created beings. They're not uh, eternal in the sense of not having had a beginning, but they are apparently immortal. They don't die. They were apparently capable of choice. We know that some of them followed Satan in his re, uh, rebellion. A hint from the book of Revelation causes us to suspect that it might have been a third of the angels. But again, we don't know that for sure. It's just a hint, though often we, we state it as a, a, a given fact. Uh, but there's that hint. Uh, that's what we believe. Um, so capable of choice. Uh, heaven is their native home, according to Matthew 24. They excel in strength, according to Psalm 103. They are God's ministers, or ministers mean servants, right? Both as ministers for God, ministering to God, uh, but also uh, uh, ministering for God to, to us, to, to those that will be inheriting salvation, we uh, will read about later. Um, they're holy, according to Matthew 25. In fact, we know that, that uh, angels surround the throne of God, right? They, there are angels over the, hovering over the top of it and everything. So they're, they're holy beings. They're, uh, they're, they're different than us, but they are creative beings. Some examples of them acting as ministering agents for God. In Second Kings, 
Uh, chapter 6, Elisha, the prophet, in his servant, wake up one morning in Dothan. And God had been giving uh, Elisha visions of uh, the Syrian army's battle plans. And, and, and so that Israel was able to thwart him, right? And so the, the king of, of Syria said, who's the spy? And they said, there's no spy. They got a prophet over there named Elisha. And God, you know, he tells Elisha what you whisper in your bedroom. Mm-hmm. And, and so he, he dispatches a whole large army to Dothan to get Elisha. So Elisha's servant wakes up in the morning. And he, you know, stumbles outside in that, you know, that groggy state of, of uh, barely awake, you know, and he looks around and here's a, a, a huge Syrian army surrounding them. It's just two of them, maybe, maybe a, 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 you know, some, some other tenants and everything, but it's just the two of them. And it, he goes into a panic and he, he tells Elisha, my Lord, look, you know, and, and, and Elisha, he, he doesn't even break a sweat. It's, it's okay. It's not a big deal. He said, more are they that are with us than uh, those that are with them. In fact, let me read it, 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17. So he, so he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes, speaking of his servant, that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You grew up. With that story being told, you know, every couple of months in your home, and angels become very important part of your thinking. Uh, in fact, in many places in the scriptures, we see angels presented as combatants doing battle on behalf of God's people. When Daniel was tossed into the lion's den, it was an angel that protected him, closed the mouth of the lion's. In Acts chapter 5 and, and, and Acts chapter 12, of course, the young Jewish boys probably didn't hear a lot about this, but angels delivered some of the apostles, a couple of them the first time, Peter alone the second time out of prison, opened locked cell gates and, you know, walked past the guards and, and everything. These are incredible beads. And, and here's one that you, you never hear about in, in uh, Luke's gospel. You remember the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar, right? And Lazarus died and uh, he was carried uh, into Abraham's bosom by the angels. So apparently angels had some part to play in that. Um, so the idea in all this is to see that what powerful beings angels are and how if you grew up in a Jewish Old Testament setting, hearing of the involvement of age, angels and giving the law, the interaction with the prophets, their ministry to, to God's chosen people, the, uh, the, the nation of Israel, um, your your uh, uh, regard for angels would be very high, uh, and so to suggest that someone is superior to the angels is a big deal, especially if that other someone is a man, right? So that's kind of the mindset that the the writer to the Hebrews is looking to overcome. But the writer uh, to the Hebrews is going to select a number of Old Testament passages to demonstrate that Christ is, in fact, superior to the angels. Uh, in, in fact, there are, I think, seven passages, actually. Uh, and, and that's phase one. But he also anticipates two specific objections or problems that will arise from this uh, in the Jewish mind. Problem number one, if he's superior uh, to the angels... How could he become a man since uh, men are a little lower than the angels? Wow, I I hadn't thought of it that way, but but that would be a a problem. You show the superiority, but now, well, wait a minute. You know, you're saying he's God, but he came. He came. How could that be? Problem uh, uh, number two: If he's superior to the angels, how could he die? Since angels don't die, so he's gonna talk about those things when we get into chapter 2. So, you see, if we don't think it through, if we don't gain that Jewish mindset, we fail to see the problem, and then the majesty indicated in the answer. And and we're also going to discover, we'll see one of them tonight, uh, the high regard regard held by the writer uh, of this epistle, as well as the readers, the ones he wrote to, for the 
the, the high regard that they had for the scriptures because these arguments hold water very soundly, but they hang on some subtle use of words. The, uh, the linguistics are, are subtle. So we'll, we'll, we'll discover that care needs to be given in handling of the word of God. And, and little details make a big difference. Jesus demonstrated that right when he uh, taught one Sabbath on the, in the synagogue and he quoted from Isaiah and, and he replaced, uh, 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 he put a period where there was a, a comma, the judgment is, is later, it's, it's forestalled. Little details like that can have a huge bearing on the way we interpret things. And so we're going to get an example of that. So again, uh, the writer's assertion in Hebrews 1 4, the you know, uh, introduction to the next topic having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Uh, then he goes on, uh, beginning in verse 5, to prove this assertion that, uh, that uh, Christ is, is uh, superior to the angels. So verse 5, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Well, I guess the basic answer is he never said it to an angel. That should be obvious. It's rhetorical in that sense. But uh, this first quote here from, uh, is from Psalm 2. And you remember Psalm 2 is, is kind of a wild psalm. It's very unique in that there's a uh, a discussion between three people. And those three people had happened to be uh, uh, fa the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The, they're, they're having a discussion. Uh, uh, and, and so let me read the first nine verses of that. Uh, verse 7 is the, the first quote that we, we get here. But why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Imagine God looking down, and <laughs> looking at man, shaking his fist at him and saying, you know, we don't want you to rule over us, God. It's hard to uh, imagine, but that's, that's what's described here. And it says uh, in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, and here's the quote, The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's Jesus talking. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. How did he do that? How, how how did he, you know, give him the nations for his inheritance? Well, by the cross. Jesus, uh, by becoming a kinsman of Adam, that's the incarnation, became our goel or our kinsman redeemer and thus was able to redeem us, right? That's how he accomplished it. And he goes on in verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And he goes on, but when did the father say, you are my son? We read that quote here in, in Psalm 2. It's prophesied here in Psalm 2. But when did he actually say it? Well, twice. Publicly, the father declared that Jesus was his son. Yeah, the first one was at his baptism. Where was the second one? Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Here him. Why two? Little details. Because two is the number of witness. By, 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 by two witnesses, a thing is established. You see how subtle it is, but, but uh, how significant? So now the second quote here uh, in, in this first argument uh, is from uh, uh, made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and then celebrated in Psalm 89. Uh, and it references the promise of God to David about the, you know, his Davidic dynasty, if you will. Let me read this, uh, verses 12 through 17. 
Uh, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, here it is, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But by mercy, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I, I uh, took it from Saul when I removed uh, from be- whom I removed from before you. Uh, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So the context is that David wanted to build a house for the Lord. But God said, no. No, David, you're, 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 you're a man of war. There, there's blood on your hands. You can't build the house. But God told him he would let his son, Solomon, uh, build the house uh, for God, the, the first temple, right? But God also told David that he, God, would build him, David, a house, referring to or meaning the Davidic dynasty that would never end. Now, there's a sense in these verses that it speaks of Solomon. But here in Hebrews, and a few other places, actually, uh, is a reference uh, referring to the Messiah, David's greater son. Why? How do we know that? How can... You know, the the writer to the Hebrews take that license. Well, notice verse 12. And here's one of those really subtle things where you got to take it very literally to to, to get its significance. It shows what a high regard uh, they had for the scriptures and that we should have for the scriptures. Verse 12, let me read it again. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So what it's telling us there is that this will actually come into full fruition or full fulfillment after David dies. Solomon became the king before David died. So in a local sense, it is a reference to Solomon, but... Uh, in the greater sense, the focus of this verse uh, is is referring to uh, to the David. So there's a real focus of this passage it goes beyond David's lifetime and his messianic, and that's why uh, here in another uh, a few other places it's associated as being messianic. Uh, subtle, but you see how we need to pay attention when we read God's word and and take it literally. And this whole idea of the Messiah being the son of David is celebrated again in in, in Psalm 89. I'll let you explore uh, it for yourself. You can read all the way through, but just a a couple of quick verses. It says down in verse 20, I have found my servant David with, or uh, I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Down in verses 26 and 27, he shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also, also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Is that describing David or David's greater son? Obviously, uh, David's greater son. Now, the idea of firstborn, we're going to encounter it a little later here in a few minutes, but sometimes is a reference to a uh, position of honor, not necessarily the uh, primogenitor or the, the, the you know, firstborn child. Uh, in fact, Solomon wasn't even the firstborn child of David. Was he? He had older brothers. Uh, And so uh, this probably has a view, the relation of the risen Christ uh, to uh, in his glorified humanity to man. And then uh, Psalm 89, verse 30, Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly, utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. And so even though David's son sinned, he kept a man on the throne for David's sake, right? And ultimately, uh, Jesus will sit on David's throne and rule the earth. Um, all God's doing. <clears throat> the author to Hebrews quotes uh, uh, 
Oh, verse 6, the, the next argument. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And here he's quoting Psalm 97, 7. By the way, you'll notice that almost all of these, his arguments come from the Psalms. I think this is telltale. See, even if you were a real studious Jew, the, the, the book of Psalms was the, was the Jewish hymn book, right? We may not know a lot about the Bible, but we sing the songs every Sunday, right? So we get to know the words to the songs. So even the, the, the non-studious Jew could relate to many of these verses. They were familiar with the Psalms. So might be one of the reasons uh, he quotes from the Psalms so much. But Psalm 97, verse 7, Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Now, the, the, the author to the Hebrews quotes the Septuagint, which translates Elohim, gods, as angels. And, and, and that word can speak of beings uh, thought to have supernatural power. So uh, most scholars uh, agree that uh, it probably is a reference to angels. Uh, though some commentators take it to be the pagan idols or the, uh, to commanded to worship uh, you know, God or worship Jesus. Still, remember the New Testament writer wrote this by inspiration. He said angels, quoting the Septuagint. That's what he understood and believed. And, and he wrote this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. To me, that settles the issue. It's angels. Um, so clearly the writer is putting Christ above the angels. Uh, again, this idea of firstborn or first begotten comes up again. It comes up several times in these arguments. The concept of firstborn is found in a number of places throughout the scriptures, and it really can be kind of complicated to grasp. It kind of is introduced in Genesis 49.3 with respect to Reuben, and the idea of firstborn is presented there is the idea of excellency and of dignity. We read, Genesis 49, verse 3, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, dignity and the excellency of power. But remember, Reuben forfeited that position of, of honor, that, that, that position of excellency of dignity uh, through his sin by going up to his father's couch, is the specific uh, quote. And so, this dominion or the, the, this, this excellently, this uh, firstborn privilege or status that was Reuben's, he forfeited and it was broken up. D the dominion portion of it was given to Judah. And that's why Messiah comes through the line of Judah. The uh, double portion aspect of, uh, of uh, the privilege of the, the, the firstborn was uh, given to Joseph, who, remember, had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh that were adopted by Jacob as, as his own sons. And so whenever you read of the 12 tribes of Israel, depending on where you read it, sometimes it says Joseph. Sometimes it doesn't say Joseph, but says Ephraim and Manasseh. One of the other tribes will be left out. And so it, it's always doing this shell game to, to get to 12. And it's, there, there's actually some method to the, the madness, if you will, there. But <clears throat> that's not for this study. So... Um, in Exodus, Israel is spoken of as God's firstborn. It, 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 what does it, what's it really referring to? Uh, again, a position of honor. In this case, putting Israel in the place of God's chosen. We know that Israel, his firstborn is his chosen people, right? Exodus 4.22, that you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. Firstborn also... Uh, means that which surpass, surpasses. There is the firstborn of the poor in Isaiah 14.30, which is speaking of those that are the extreme poor. There's the firstborn of, of death, meaning uh, surpa uh, the, you know, the surpassingness of death mentioned in Job 8, 13, 18.13. Uh, in Jeremiah 3.19, it's referring to Ephraim, who was not the firstborn, but was treated, you know, by uh, Isaac as the firstborn. Uh, and it kind of, kind of describes him as being deeply loved or, or more loved uh, 
uh, if you will. He was the one that received the greater honor. In the New Testament, the word is found nine times. Uh, it's the Greek word uh, prototokos, and eight of the nine times it occurs in the New Testament refer to Jesus. So the idea of firstborn here isn't the idea that, you know, where some of the cults want to say, well, he was the firstborn, he was begotten, he was, you know, he, 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 uh, <coughs> he's not eternal God. No, it's referring to position, <coughs> or title. It's one of the, the titles of Jesus, actually. <coughs> so, uh, better than the angels, uh, 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 verses 7 through 9. Uh, and of the angels, he, he says, uh, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Here he's quoting Psalm 104, verse 4. Actually, we're doing good, I think. Uh, you know, as ministers of fire, we might think of those angels that brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And burning hailstones raining down and, you know, all that. Uh, you, 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 several places where angels are associated with fire or, or, or appearing like fire. Uh, but he, he goes on, he, he says, uh, who makes his angel spirits and ministers uh, a flame of fire. And he goes on in, his, in this particular argument in verses uh, 8 and 9. He says, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Unto the Son, he says, who is he? God the Father. And here he quotes Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Uh, and what we may miss is, is what we just read. Uh, if we just read the Psalm and don't read what the writer to Hebrews says here, but the, uh, the author to the Hebrews is telling us that the Father says to the Son, your throne, O God. He calls him God. That's a statement of deity concerning Jesus Christ. It's hard to wriggle out of that one. <laughs> God himself says, Jesus is God. Pretty powerful. Uh, and, and how long is his throne? It's forever. We encounter this inter e eternal reign of the Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, in Daniel 7, uh, in the promise to Mary in Luke 1, in Revelation 22, 1 through 4. So it's not a new concept to you and I. <coughs> But again, the, 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 the Jewish mind said that, you know, he would be struggling with some of these things. We see that uh, his reign is a righteous reign. And there are two sides to his righteous reign. He loves righteousness. The part we don't focus on is he hates wickedness. Practical lesson for you and I. We need to not only love uh, righteousness, we need to hate sin. <coughs> but do we? You know, if sin was just ugly all the time, <laughs> we wouldn't be in trouble, right? <laughs> but no, it's pleasurable for a season, and, and we struggle with that. We, uh, and so we would do well to make that an area of prayer on our part. God, help me to hate sin. You know my proclivity for this particular sin. God, help me to hate it. I remember my pastor, you know, being a, an ex, you know, just hippie drug freak that blew his mind out so bad he couldn't make a bologna sandwich for himself, didn't consider marijuana a drug. And so he'd slip, after he became a Christian, he'd slip every once in a while and smoke pot, and, and, and then he'd feel convicted. Oh, God, I hate this. And God busted him one day and said, no, John, you don't hate it. You love it. In fact, you love it more than you love me. And until you get honest with me, we're stuck. <laughs> wow. It opened his eyes. And so he had to take this serious and say, you're right, God. I confess to you, I love smoking pot. In fact, I know you don't want me to do it. And I, 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 the fact that I do shows me I love it more than you. I want to learn to hate it. And God changed his heart. God likes honesty. So uh, a practical lesson here, uh, God helped me to hate sin. Uh, there are eight issues in, in these two verses uh, uh, that, that perhaps we didn't really catch, these two verses from 
uh, Psalm 45. By the way, Psalm 45 is an incredible, there's a lot of information about Messiah. Go read Psalm 45 sometime and, and just spend some time thinking of it. But in these two, just these two verses, eight issues, uh, 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 he announces the deity of Jesus, uh, presents his position his uh, uh, at his throne, his kingship, the excellency or impartiality of his reign, the perfection of his character on earth, the place of his subjection, uh, his reward in terms of being anointed, and his preeminence. All of that was in these two verses. So uh, a, a lot to chew on here. The point being that angels are servants, the son is the eternal king. The angels are said to be his angels here. That is, they belong to God. So... Who's the greater then? The Son, not, not the angels. Verses 10 through 12. <coughs> and you, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will uh, be changed, but you are the same, uh, and your years will not fail. He's quoting from Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. And just as an aside, we were talking about Israel and uh, modern-day Israel and her becoming a nation a little bit earlier. But uh, down in, and this is kind of off the subject, has nothing to do with the subject, but in another sense has everything to do with the subject. Psalm 102, uh, verse 16 says, For the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. Is, is, is the Lord building Zion? <laughs> the beauty of Zion today? Absolutely. If you, if you would look over what's happened in, in Israel since 1948, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's miraculous. It's incredible. But does that tell us? We're in that, that era, that, that, that time frame, not exact. We don't know the day or the hour, but we're in that time frame where the Lord will show, uh, appear in his glory. That's exciting. That's encouraging for us because we see what's going over, on over in Israel. We know Jesus is coming back. That's exciting. But that's an aside. The point here is the immutability of the Messiah. We talked about that. So Marty talked about that Sunday night a little bit. Uh, immutability means the the unchangeableness of you know that God doesn't change. The the immutability of the the Messiah because he and because he's God Creator. The creation changes, but God never does. Immutability is an attribute that belongs only to God. It's a, that that uh, is another reason he's uh, better than the angel. Angels change. Uh, their, their ministry changes. It's in flux, but God never changes. Um, and, and what's more is he's the creator, so he created the angels. Then finally, verses 13 and 14. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? <clears throat> and this is the author's uh, final shot at this point in demonstrating the superiority of Christ over the angels. Now, God never said this to an angel, uh, but did to the Messiah. And the quote here is from Psalm 110, verse 1. Which, by the way, Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in, in the New Testament, interestingly enough. We're gonna, it's going to come up again uh, later in our study. Um, not tonight, but uh, it is to the Son, the Messiah, that God uh, invite, it gave the invitation to sit at his right hand. And he goes on to explain uh, what the angels are. They're, they're ministering spirits, servants. Uh, of God, if you will, to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Who are those that will inherit salvation? That's us, yeah. Those that believe in Jesus. And so uh, part of their main ministry is to minister for God, uh, you know, uh, on, on our behalf. So to wrap it up, Jesus is better than the angels because he has obtained a better name than they. 
He's better than, uh, uh, than the angels because uh, of his sonship to the Father. He's better than the angels because God commands the angels to worship him. Uh, he's better than the angels because he's the eternal king and ascribed deity by the Father, and, and they are his servants. He's the uh, better than the angels because he's the uh, immutable creator God, but they are created beings. And, and then finally, he's superior to the uh, angels because he's co-ruler with the Father. And again, they are ministering servants to those appointed to salvation by God. So uh, six very strong arguments uh, demonstrating the superiority of angels, uh, 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 of Christ over the angels. Now, he's going to tackle those problems now. If, if he's greater than the angels, how could he become a man? And if he's greater than the angels, how could he die? And I think the answers give us a, 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 a wonderful peek into just how majestic our Savior is. So, uh, that's where we're headed next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for helping us get done actually a little bit early tonight. Uh, Lord, help us to absorb these things, to contemplate them. Uh, Lord, uh, I know that not one of us uh, would be able to stand on our legs if we were suddenly in the presence of an angel and yet there are nothing in comparison to you. God, just as the, the Jews sometimes thought more highly of angels than they should, in our culture we sometimes get things out of perspective. Help us to have that right perspective of the superiority of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and Lord, let us walk in the light of that knowledge. Uh, and, and may it cause rejoicing in our heart uh, the more that we see the reality of it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.